Alright, buenos dias, mis amigos. Alright, so today I'm gonna uh, play a clip from this guy here and I'm gonna, you know, give him uh, credit or whatever because he does a good job. And then here I might pick on this guy here. He's babbles a bunch of nonsense and but then my main focus is going to be on this guy here I'm going to play a, a clip from about 14 minute mark and then I'm going to jump back here to the 34 minute mark and um, I'm going to show you the con the error alright the spirit of error and then I will show you the spirit of truth and make it simple and easy for you now I want to address this comment here from uh, this youtuber Alder Ringer, or however you say that, he says you jump around too much, and sad face, and uh, so I appreciate that criticism, and uh, I'll keep that in mind, and I'll try to make things easy and simple to understand, and I, I certainly apologize for any confusion that I may have caused. Now, not to excuse the the error of my teaching or the weakness of my teaching if you will um, but I do notice a lot of people do that uh, so I mean it's a it's a tactic almost uh, to me it seems like people want to jump around so much that by the time they get back to the original point everything's forgotten and I, I want to make things simple so I do appreciate that comment and I'll try to keep that in mind as uh, as I'm going through these. So let's start off with what's what. Uh, let's start off with what's right here. All right. I'm gonna. I guess I'll start off here and uh, commend this guy for doing a good job, and then I'll go back and show uh, the error of this of this guy here. All right. So let's listen. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of uh, static, and there's nothing I can do about it. It's just the way it was recorded, but I'll go over what he's teaching here in a minute. In chapter 20, is in verses 1 through 3, we saw at that time how an angel comes down from heaven uh, with a key to the bottomless pit in one hand and a great chain in the other, and it says he binds up Satan such that he is then locked away in the bottomless pit, and he's sealed there for a thousand years so that he cannot deceive the nations any longer. Okay? Then, in verses 4 through 6, right after this, now that Satan had been bound up, it says the church reigns with Christ uh, during that thousand years, and during this time then, the world becomes increasingly Christianized. And the, God and the world becomes increasingly Christianized when Satan is bound. So that's a good word to, to use. All right, and so again, I apologize for the static. It's a, a little bit annoying, but I only got a look, a few more seconds to go here, so hang with me. The gospel goes forth because Satan is no longer able to deceive the nations like he once was able to do. And then in verses seven through ten, which is what we looked at just last week, we saw that at the end of this thousand-year period, uh, the Lord will actually let Satan out from his prison, and at that point, he will then gather. So, now maybe I'm not understanding this fella correctly, all right, but to me it seems like um, real simple. So, just to reiterate or whatever, um, to go over what 
I got from what he was teaching is that uh, the dragon or Satan, devil, the old serpent, is bound and then the world is Christianized. That's when Jesus comes and makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him for a thousand years. And then, of course, at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed and they... What he the way he describes it is he they surround the church, right? So it doesn't matter; it's there anyway. Um, and so that's exactly what we read here, right? And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. Of course, this is when we are lifted up in the air, right? And our enemy is gathered at our feet, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. This is consistent with what we read from Genesis to Revelation. We're being told the same scenario over and over. That when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it's the end of the world. Therefore, the end of the thousand years is the end of the world. Right? This is when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever. Right? So, it's pretty simple pretty straightforward I don't want to jump around too much but in Genesis 3 verse 15 it does say that uh, the Lord said to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel when that's when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent destroying all evil forever and so also we have a parallel here in Revelation 20 verse 9 when it says and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them now you are incorrect to imagine that the saved people are on the earth they're not Fire does not come down from God out of heaven on top of us. It doesn't happen. It does not happen. We're in the air. See, when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, we're not down there on the earth with the serpent. We're not. We're not, we're not the unsaved. We are the saved. Right? And so also in... Matthew uh, chapter 13 with the parable of the wheat and the tares right the tares are gathered and they are put in bundles and they are burned right but the wheat they are gathered into his barn so we're up in the air with the Lord and fire comes down out of heaven and burns the tares, the unsaved, right? So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, this is when God separates the sheep from the goat, the saved from the unsaved. All right, and it seems to me, I could be wrong, it seems to me like this guy is preaching the simplicity of Christ and his return for us. Now, not so simply, uh, is this gentleman here and I listened to 20 some minutes of his preaching because I wanted to hear what he had to say about what this thousand years is all about and I, I'm not I'm still not sure if he ever got to that point but we'll listen give him a chance here and see what he has to say so I'm gonna play about a minute here uh, starting about here. Let's play about a minute here and listen to what he says. Second chance. Every single one of us will be in the resurrection of life, resurrected when Jesus comes to rejoice in joy and happiness. The resurrection of life is a glorious new beginning, a beginning of a new world without any suffering or heartache or pain or sickness or disease. The resurrection of damnation is a tragic ending. It's a resurrection of sorrow and heartache and grief. 
the resurrection of damnation is the end of a tragic life. And every single one of us will be in the resurrection of life or the resurrection of damnation. And the okay, yeah, that's great. So I, I'm going to jump around a little bit. All right, I know some of you might not like this. I get it. But I want to jump around and draw some parallels and connect some dots here. So in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, we read, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Right, so this is a description of the end of the world when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and every eye shall see him, okay? Even they which pierced him. Right, I'm going to jump around a little bit more. So I apologize for this, but in Revelation chapter 1 we see that when he comes, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. All right, that means those that are dead, the living and the dead, are going to see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. That can only mean that all the saved are resurrected, and all the unsaved are resurrected some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt even they which pierced them they're dead they've been dead for a long time they also which pierced them those guys they've been dead for a very long time this means everybody's gonna see him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him because they know it's the end of the world it's judgment day the great and terrible day of the Lord and the choices that we make today to respond to the impressions of the Holy Spirit will eventually determine our eternal destiny whether we're in that resurrection of life or in the resurrection of damnation all right, so this is where he goes on for a little while, and um, he never really gets to what uh, you know happens during this thousand years because he is very subtly presenting this idea of a thousand years as though it happens after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. So it takes them about 20 minutes, and then we get to hear. Let's listen. Thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 5. The rest of the dead. Who are the rest of the dead? The ones that didn't reign with Christ in heaven on thrones. The wicked. The rest of the dead. Those that were in their graves when Jesus came. Those that were destroyed by the brightness of His coming. But the rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years were finished. So the wicked are resurrected, and as they are resurrected. They are resurrected the second resurrection. Remember the Bible says, All that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil to the resurrection of what? Damnation. The resurrection of life takes place at the beginning of the thousand years. The resurrection of damnation takes place at the when? End of the thousand years. Alright, so let me sort of go over this um, absolute bat poop insanity so what this guy preaches oh what is SDA oh I forget what SDA is it's something what is SDA? SDA. What is SDA? Seventh day Adventist. That's what it is. Ha! 
All right, so I just noticed that. All right, who cares? Uh, it doesn't matter, really, um, because he's not alone. Seventh-day Adventists are not alone in teaching this craziness. But just consider what he's teaching. He's teaching that when Jesus comes back, then those of us that are born of God are resurrected. Now, uh, if I guess if I played the whole thing, you would see that when Jesus comes back, he says that all the wicked people are destroyed, they're killed. It's the end for them. Okay. And we are resurrected. Those of us that are born of God, we are resurrected. I mean, he's got that part right, but then he's got a thousand years where he equates to Genesis 1, verse 1, or 2, whatever verse that was. Excuse me, I think it's verse 2. Or yeah, verse 2, where it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So he's equating this thousand years as being an earth without a person. And he quotes some prophet, um, Jeremiah possibly. All right, it doesn't matter, really. Because this idea is lunacy. We're going to be up in the air with the Lord for a thousand years, and the dead are going to be dead for a thousand years. See, this suggests that when Jesus returns, when he comes in the clouds of heaven, that the dead are not resurrected. And that's absolutely inconsistent, uh, in particular with what we read uh, in Revelation Chapter 1. Behold, he comes with cloud, and every eye shall see him. Alright, see, so he's claiming after the thousand years, a thousand years after we're resurrected, then the unsaved are resurrected. They're dead for this entire time on the earth. There's nobody on earth for a thousand years. All right. I don't want to skim through this video and find the exact quote, but just take my word for it. That's what he says. All right. Now, I mean, come on, man. Do you not see this? This is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Because when Jesus comes, every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him. Now you have to claim that the Bible is wrong right here in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 in order to make that claim. The Bible has to be wrong. And so we can't trust our Bible. We gotta trust what Reverend Finley says. Now this is a problem, man. This is an absolute problem. And the thing is, man, this is this guy's not alone in teaching all these lunatical doctrines. I mean, they'll teach anything and everything but the simple truth that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. Why is that so hard? For people to understand I don't I don't know uh, because well you know there's a verse here in uh, was second Timothy oh wait a second I don't remember first Timothy somewhere in the Bible it says something let's find out let's find out if I can find some second Timothy 4 verse 4 and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables Titus 1 verse 14 not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from 
the truth and what happens here in the last days evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived uh, people today don't care about the truth they'll teach anything and everything but the simple truth Jesus was asked this very question what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and the end of the world is when he comes in the clouds of heaven there, there should really be no dispute about this yet people so many people got it wrong it's, it's incredible even mr. Uh, fancy pants here let's listen to what he has to say all that comes to mind when they think of the millennium uh, but for others and for many Christians in particular this phrase the millennium uh, is of great fascination because it's used to refer to a thousand year reign of Christ that's referred to in Revelation 20 it comes up well what he, this guy just told a lie we're not even one minute into his 45 minute sermon and I get the impression that these guys, all they want to do is get their 45 minutes in and then collect the money from you and get out and get on, you know, go to their yacht or whatever they do. Go drive their their sports car and look cool and all that sort of stuff. They get their 45 minutes in and then they take the money from you and they're out. And they don't give a dog darn about the truth at all. Not even one minute and he's telling a lie. Did you hear what he said? I mean, how can you be a pretend to be a preacher of God and then start your sermon by telling a lie? Millennium uh, is of great fascination because it's used to refer to a thousand year reign of Christ that's referred to in Revelation 20. It comes up. No, that's not it. He just lied. What? He says. Um, thousand year millennial reign of Christ and that's not in Revelation 20 anywhere I can't show it to you because it's not here it does talk about a thousand years it does do that but it doesn't talk about Jesus reigning a thousand years at all it doesn't say Christ reigns a thousand years it says they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years again they shall be priests of God and of Christ shall reign with him a thousand years it makes no mention of this idea of Jesus reigning a thousand years and if it did then we'd have a problem wouldn't we we'd have a serious problem in Luke chapter 1 verse 33 it says uh, speaking of Jesus it says he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end he reigns forever not a thousand years what are you guys teaching It's unbelievable. Uh, you're just flat out lying when you say Jesus reigns a thousand years. It's not here. It's talking about us. Christians. We that are born of God. We reign with Christ right now. It's not Jesus reigning for a thousand years. He reigns forever we're not putting our hope into a thousand years of driving around in a sports car or whatever kind of fantasy that this gentleman has we're putting our hope into a life that never ends eternity uh, this is still nonsense unbelievable all right so that's all I got man that's all I I just want to show these guys they lie and they don't even blink when they're telling a lie so let's go over this for somebody that's new and again I, 
I'll try to prevent from jumping around, but uh, to me it, it is interesting when we draw parallels with everything else that we're reading in the Bible. All right, and then for example, uh, 1 Corinthians. You know what? Before I get into this, there's something I wanted to share. Um, I wanted to add a little bit uh, for those that do uh, tune in frequently to what I'm preaching here let me sort of add in a little you know something new because there's so much in uh, the Bible that, that preaches the same thing man and so let me start off by uh, getting adding something uh, new that supports what I'm preaching here I mean the whole Bible does right but I don't want to get too far into it uh, or I don't want to overload I don't want to put too much on the table um, but I th I think it's this guy here uh, somewhere early on he uh, doesn't matter he teaches that uh, well he says uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 teaches what happens when Christ returns right because in 1st Thessalonians 4 it talks about for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord alright so this this is important to understand that Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven just like what we read in Revelation chapter 1 alright forgive me I'm jumping around here all right, in Revelation chapter 1, excuse me. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, even they which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Now this is consistent with everything that we're reading in the Bible. Matthew 24, it says, He comes in the clouds. He shall appear, uh, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn, right? When they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, right? Behold, he cometh with clouds, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, right? And of course, in Matthew 24, it talks about the trumpets, right? In First um, Thessalonians 4, right? It says, uh, the, with the voice of the archangel, uh, the, with the trump of God, right? I mean, th this is the same moment in time. That's important to understand. Now, uh, what this fella here says is that First Thessalonians four talks about what happens to us that are saved, and then he says in Second Thessalonians one it talks about what happens to them that are not saved. All right, so let's let's go over 2nd Thessalonians chapter 1 and there's only 12 verses so it just take me a little bit to read this but I, I want to read the whole thing so that there's no confusion no doubts so everything is crystal clear okay Paul and Silvanus Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounds. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is manifest 
token, which is a, a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of, good, of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ alright so that's second Thessalonians 1 now in this what I just read for you did you get the impression that when Jesus comes we're gonna be resurrected and then a thousand years later the unsaved are gonna get resurrected did you get that impression anywhere ah uh, no neither did I alright because it's not there it's very clear that when Jesus comes in the clouds it is the end of the world all right so uh, where's this now uh, right let's go up here where's this uh, right here seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This is echoed all throughout the Bible. Right? We read this in particular in Matthew 24. Right? And then in Revelation 1 also, behold, he comes with clouds. Right? It's consistent with everything that we're reading in the Bible. When Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. So, this judgment day, it's not a thousand, it's not the beginning of a, th I mean, what in the world are these guys teaching? And what is so confusing about this? Man, to take this and to say, well, it's not really the end of the world for them. They're, they get another thousand years. Whether you want to say they get a thousand years of walking around on earth, a second chance to be saved, or if you want to say that they're just, everybody's killed, but then they got to wait a thousand years in order for them to be resurrected and judged and then killed the second death. It doesn't make any sense, man. I mean, this idea to try to play along so everybody is killed when Jesus comes why wait a thousand years so we're up in heaven with the Lord waiting for this thousand years to get over with so we can be set back down on an on the earth on a new earth with a new heaven I mean it's clear that this happens after the thousand years. It's no, there's no question about it. There's, but there's only one conclusion to be made. And that at the end of the thousand years, it's the end of the world. That's the only possible conclusion. Right? It's when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven when he comes with his angels 
and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. It's the end. It's the end of the world. Right? And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They, they don't obey because they don't believe. And who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So you have to say this verse is wrong if you're going to make the claim that the unsaved are destroyed a thousand years later after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. This verse is wrong. Jesus doesn't punish them with everlasting destruction. At when he comes in the clouds of heaven. That happens a thousand years later. And how in the world do you read this and imagine? That it's not. It's. I mean, you can't. You can't do it. You cannot, um, you cannot see anywhere in here that implies that it's a thousand years after Jesus returns that he destroys the unsaved and that the saved are uh, resurrected before this I mean it's not there man it's just not here at all when he shall come to be glorified in his saints see this is when he comes to be glorified in his saints that's when he comes in the clouds of heaven that's when we are resurrected right that's when uh, we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye that's when we put on incorruption that's when we put on immortality when he comes in the clouds of heaven there's just no way to spin it now look I get it I'm jumping all over the place here but I'm what I'm doing is connecting the dots here it's telling you us the same thing over and over all throughout the Bible it's completely consistent and it's very simple when Jesus comes it's the end of the world it's judgment day it's the great and terrible day of the Lord it this stuff here it's for the birds man I'm telling you why would you preach this stuff it makes no sense and the only thing that the only thing that you know I can think of is that these guys they don't know they don't know so they're just teaching whatever they're getting their 45 minute sermons in and they're taking your money and then they're driving off to paradise what they think is paradise and so uh, you know we that are of God we for us it's okay right let them get their time in now because later it's going to be our time right you understand what I mean right the rich people they have their time right now us poor folk that are born of God our time is coming and our time is much greater than their time guarantee it right and so one of these days I'd like to talk a little bit more about you know just give you some thoughts on what I think what I believe what I speculate uh, what it will be like in the life to come and yeah, we get we get um, you know some clues if you will uh, all throughout the Bible but in particular here in Revelation 21 and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I John saw the holy city new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them 
and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He's going to make all things new. New heaven, new earth, no more evil at all. And this is obviously at what happens after the end of the world. At the end of the world, it's judgment day. All evils destroyed. And you know what? It's interesting here. I'm going to jump all around the Bible here. I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to go from Revelation all the way back to Genesis. And I'm going to strongly contend that what we read in Revelation is echoed all throughout the Bible. What we read in Genesis is echoed all throughout the Bible. And what we read in Genesis parallels with what we read in Revelation. And what we read in Genesis is the Lord saying to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It, this happens here at the end of of the world when God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent destroying all evil forever all right we're reading this all throughout the Bible all right it's consistent all throughout the Bible so when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up in the air, and our enemy is gathered at our feet, and Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever. This is consistent all throughout the Bible consistent all throughout the Bible let's just go someplace right smack in the middle and we're gonna see that it's consistent all throughout the Bible in Psalm 110 verse 1 the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel until I make thine enemies thy footstool and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them this is talking about the very exact same thing from Genesis to Revelation when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world and everybody's gonna know it 